It's often remarked that social and economic inequality is the price of human creativity and economic growth, that it's unavoidable, that the world in which multi-billion dollar fortunes coincide with poverty and social exclusion is the best of all possible worlds, where the rich get richer, the middle have to work ever harder to keep what they have, and the poor are blamed for their deprivation. That is the world of the 21st century. But does it have to be? This online presentation will argue that our very human nature demands justice and fairness. That social alternatives that put mutual support and solidarity at the center of human life are readily available today. And that such alternatives must become the basis of transformative politics in Canada and the world. The strength of this vision rests on a well-established model of economic organization called the Co-op. There are over 1 billion Co-op members worldwide. They provide quarter of a billion jobs globally. And in Canada, Co-ops provide goods and services to over 18 million members. And all of this economic activity is governed through a democratic model of one member, one vote. This online presentation serves as a follow-up to a documentary film, A Silent Transformation. For more information, please visit the official website at asilenttransformation.ca. While the feature focuses in detail on the cooperative model, this online edition will set the cooperative enterprise in the wider context of anthropology, history, and political economy. The first part of the series will discuss the effects of hierarchy and social exclusion on human health and how it can be overcome through cooperation. Part 2 will discuss the challenges to cooperation and capitalism of the 21st century. And Part 3 will chart a new transformative politics. I'm really annoyed that they've given me <laughs> cufflinks. It seems to me it, it, cufflinks are a sort of status thing. Yeah, and wear the, the shirts that I don't have any shirts that need them. That's Richard Wilkinson, Emeritus Professor of Social Epidemiology and co author of The Spirit Level Why More Equal Society is Almost Always the Better. We sat down with Richard at the International Summit of Cooperatives in Quebec City to discuss the complicated relationships between individuals and society. Richard began by telling us about two opposite ways social relations can be organized. Human beings have lived in everything, from the most uh, egalitarian of the prehistoric hunting and gathering societies, uh, with food sharing and gift exchange, to the most tyrannical hierarchies. But you see, there has always been the opposition between friendship and social hierarchy, and why they are, if you like, the two opposite ways people and come together is if we don't have some understanding that we don't compete for basic necessities but share them and we cooperate, if we don't have that, then whoever is strongest gets the first pick. If you're stronger than me, I wait until you've had your fill. And that is what produces a social hierarchy. You can see it very simply and clearly in animals. The dominants are the physically strongest. In our societies, we have all sorts of other markers of, if you like, cultural strength and money and, and so on. But always, the most powerful are the richest, with the highest status. Those status, power, and wealth always go together. And it's also why a gift is the most concrete symbol that I am not going to compete with you uh, for access to basic necessities. Even in the communion, in religious terms, the sharing of bread and wine, or the fact that we eat together. It's about not competing for basic necessities. We are a sharing group. And words like companion contain that, the common pan. It's about people who share food, necessities. It goes very deep in human uh, psychology. Our religious intuitions and etymology of words like companion, compagnier, and copa relate the crucial concern human beings have for friendship and non-competitive relationships among peers. And an act of gift-giving is a gesture more profound than merely one of goodwill. 
it represents a recognition that the friendship of another is a greater gift than any mere material possession. When I was growing up, my mom always told me that we're all important people. We all have a purpose. We are all given gifts when we're born. In the housing cooperative, those gifts become very important. And so when you look at people coming together and having the strength to come together in unity that way, it just gives you that much more of a strength in your own passions and in the way that you are to carry out giving your gifts. You're going to find your strengths. You're going to acknowledge your weaknesses. You're going to be able to benefit from those and carry them over to becoming strengths because of the things that you're learning. That's Tina Stevens. She's the president of the Native Intertribal Housing Cooperative in London, Ontario. The idea of a sharing group has been the cultural strength of First Nations communities. And the same ideal of equitable relations among members lies at the core of cooperative organizations like housing corps. Tina began by telling us how Native Intertribal got established. It's been in existence for more now than 30 years, um, closer to 35 years. Um, it always has been a cooperative housing structure that has been made here for families. A lot of them were moving into the city for not only education, but they were also moving into the city for work. So when they would come in to try and strive to better themselves, they started hitting a, a lot of closed doors because of the fact that they were native. Our families out in those areas, in those communities, they were able to um, form this agreement uh, to have Native Intertribal Housing Cooperative uh, created. It allows them to make that transition into the City of London, but still maintain their cultural way of life and being able to have the safety of their own four walls um, of living with family and still being close to family. From our background and our teachings, you definitely don't have any person who is above, and you definitely don't have any person that is to be treated any lesser. Um, you come in as a circle of being able to discuss the issues, and so that everybody has that right to have that voice. And that's similar again to the cooperative principles itself. Everybody has a voice as being a member, a housing member of that cooperative. You as well have the community sense because of the fact that they have the experience that they bring to that circle from their workplaces as well. They could be accountants, they, they, they can be lawyers, they can be teachers, they can be people that work in the fast food industry. All of that experience gets absorbed into that circle when we're making those decisions. And again, it doesn't matter what your status is, Everybody's included in that circle. It doesn't matter from where you are in life. You may be exiting the world in the sense of being that elder, being um, a person who's, who's aging. We have the middle generation in regards to the people that are still out there working, working towards retirement, working towards uh, living in those golden years. And then you have the, the future generation that's coming up behind us. The importance of community and family may not be something always emphasized in our individualistic, often atomized society. Many of us don't live in a supporting community that we can rely on. Modern life often takes us far from family, and a hectic pace can make it difficult to make new and lasting relationships. But research shows that social support from friends and those close to us is crucial for our health and well-being. People with fewer friends, more isolated, uh, are four times as likely to develop colds. Or experiments where they make little puncture wounds in your hand and measure how quickly they heal. If you have a bad relationship with your partner, they heal more slowly. A powerful part of the causality of the health differences were psychosocial factors to do with chronic stress. A whole series of psychological experiments have been done where people, volunteers, are given stressful things to do um, while having the levels of cortisol, the central stress hormone, measured. And those studies were reviewed by somebody looking to see what kinds of stressor 
pushed up our levels of cortisol most dramatically. And they found that it was um, what they called social evaluative threats. Threats to self-esteem or social status where other people could judge you negatively. So any task where you feel worried about how you're going to be seen and judged. And that fits very well with the epidemiological literature, which finds that the main sources of stress are first things to do with social status, being low social status, feeling you're not valued, you're looked down on. Then a difficult early childhood, which has casts a long shadow forwards to health later in life. It looks as if early childhood tunes your stress responses but then also friendship. Because if you've got friends, you feel better about yourself. You get positive feedback. Whereas if you feel people don't include you, you're excluded, they don't invite you to things, people don't sit next to you, we all immediately feel those, that, that kind of self-doubt comes crowding in. Maybe I'm unattractive, boring, socially gauche. And those social evaluative judgments are exactly what are the most powerful sources of stress. When we first started to realize that stress was important, and when I say we, I mean researchers around the world looking at health differences, one of the questions that came up I immediately is whether there were lots of different kinds of stress having different physiological effects. But it looks as if the main processes are to do with a, a central, if you like, the flight and fight mechanisms uh, rises in cortisol, the central stress hormones, triggering all sorts of other physiological processes. If you've got to deal with an emergency, tissue maintenance and repair doesn't matter. Digestion doesn't matter. Reproductive functions don't matter. If you've got to save your life in 10 minutes, then those things get lower priority. But if we go on worrying about things for weeks and months and years, then because all those things are down-regulated, uh, we become more vulnerable to a whole range of diseases. And if stress goes on for more than about an hour, um, the immune system is down-regulated. Research into stress caused by social evaluative threats highlights why inequality in social hierarchy are not merely corrosive of political democracy, but are literally a health hazard. The crucial importance of cooperatives then lies in their inclusive and horizontal organization. As Tina Stevens put it about native intertribal, co-op members come in as a circle in which they can participate and make decisions as equal peers. The importance of social inclusion for human health cannot be overstated. Well, the World Health Organization has a hierarchy of the social determinants of health. The most serious thing that can happen to you is social isolation. If you're isolated from other people, then you're in big trouble. Vanessa Hammond is the chairperson of the Healthcare Cooperative Federation of Canada. Like Richard, Vanessa stresses broader social and material conditions required for human health. So the World Health Organization says social inclusion and then clean water, and we're really lucky in Canada. We have clean water coming out of the taps in almost every home, and then nutritious food, and we're lucky we have good access to food, but we can encourage people to buy locally grown food that hasn't been in a truck for thousands of kilometers and then safe housing, which is a real issue in many of our cities, and it's something that the health co-ops are working with other organizations to try to address that problem. Then you have to have the means of maintaining those, so either a job or some kind of financial support or a little piece of land where you can grow some veggies. And then the final thing on the World Health Organization's list is health services in the sense of medical services. You need all the other things first, and we're very aware of that. So good health care means good basic amenities, stable economic resources, and good community life where people can feel included and supported, where they can be relaxed and provide good parenting environment to their kids. It is this expansive understanding of human health and well-being why co-ops are critical today. 
when I ask people in my community, why do you join the health co-op? The reason that they give more than any other is because we can volunteer in our community and help the wellness of other people in the community. So we have a lot of volunteers who work on our programs and they know also that when they need any care, it's high quality because we really focus on wellness, trying to keep you as healthy as you can possibly be. And then if you do get sick, let's try to get things dealt with as quickly as possible. People come in and they think that their problem is a headache, but when you talk to them, you actually discover that their problem is they have a child who is in trouble, they have a parent with dementia, they don't need a doctor, they need somebody to help them get the support they need. And health co-ops are good at viewing the whole person and their whole life situation. If children get the right support and their families get the right support, many problems can be avoided. But once they get into a situation of problems, it's much more costly and difficult to get people out of the problem. So people say, well, how does a health co-op work when we have a healthcare system? Well, when you have a healthcare system, there's government funding, but somebody still has to deliver the health care. So maybe it's a private practitioner, maybe it's a community hospital, but why not a co-op? And the benefit of a co-op delivering health care is that the co-op will focus on the needs of the members, not on what somebody in an office somewhere else will say is really important. And this is why you get the differences in health care. People are getting the services that are most important to them. And in health co-ops, you'll find the users of the health system, you'll find the suppliers, the professionals, the community supporters. So everyone gets a voice. The incorporation of different stakeholder groups into the ownership structure of co-ops not only ensures democratic decision-making, but also efficiency of service. This co-op responsiveness to the needs of their members meant that the provision of the social determinants of health has been their historic mission. As we have heard, one of the main such determinants, next to housing and social inclusion, is nutritious food. The concept of wanting to support local farmers in the Greenbelt, wanting to emphasize um, the integration of urban agriculture and local food consumption in the urban environment, all of these things uh, are important political considerations on the part of, of some urbanites, but what mechanisms, what avenues did they have for actually democratically seeing that some of these things happened? None. So they got together in, in someone's living room over in Parkdale High Park and created the West End Food Co-op. James Partnan is a co-op developer and a former coordinator at the West End Food Co-op, a multi-stakeholder cooperative in Parkdale, Toronto. Rising inequality across Canada means that even in wealthy urban areas like Toronto, food insecurity may be a real problem. This challenge in Parkdale brought together the West End with a local health clinic. So the Parkdale Community Health Centre is a community health centre here in Parkdale, specifically meant to target uh, delivery of health care to marginalized people in this neighbourhood. They uh, got lots of wonderful Ministry of Health funding to make their beautiful building and provide all the health healthcare services that they do. But they had this great big empty basement and not a whole lot of capacity to actually meaningfully counteract what they saw as one of the key issues facing their marginalized population, which is food insecurity. They heard that we were looking for space for our, to open our storefront, and they thought, well, we have this basement that we don't use. Maybe we can find a way to collaborate with the West End Food Co-op. And they said, well, you can give us a lot of interesting experience about food insecurity. They were aware of our community candidate and what we'd done with respect to um, educating people about food insecurity as part of our workshops. And we said, well, you could give us cheap rent. <laughs> and, and they went for it. There's no way they would have let uh, you know, a for-profit grocery store inhabit their basement or, or dry cleaning service inhabit their basement. They might have eventually gotten around to, to renovating it so that various community groups could use it, but we are a community group. We have 5,000 members in part. We're a huge community group and we do very legitimate, very explicit community work. The West End has a number of components that provide a broad range of the community work that it does. 
farmer's market came first. Um, you know, a very popular, kids-oriented, community-oriented farmer's market right here in the West End. Um, that engages the community, gets people literally to socialize, but also to actually meet real-life farmers uh, and purchase things from them, support the farmers, learn about farming, and of course gives a, yet another new market to these particularly small local farmers. Next came the community cannery. The community cannery specifically educates people and empowers them to be able to preserve their own food, local or otherwise, however they get it, um, engages the community in collaborative work. Right? So we work together at the community cannery, not only to share skills, but through our, our CSO program, our community shared orchard program, to literally over the summer or the fall, collaboratively can and preserve enough food to meaningfully impact your food consumption habits for that, that particular winter. If you're getting a tomato from the supermarket in the middle of January, it's not a local tomato and it's traveled who knows how far with what environmental footprint and uh, being inculcated with the values of who knows what organizations. If you make your own tomato sauce in August and September when you've got a lot of local tomatoes grown by a farmer you know, you can have the sauce from those tomatoes all year round. So that's far more direct. You know where those tomatoes came from. You know what effort went into actually putting them into a jar. You're empowered, much more empowered um, at all stages of that system than to actually have some control over the tomatoes that you eat all year round. Though its work is around food security, the West End's implicit mission, like that of many co-ops, is to empower people. Its multi-stakeholder model is the key. The West End Food Co-op was specifically designed to counteract power imbalances by, by engaging the interests of all three stakeholder groups distinctly. So farmers come to the table as producers come to our board, workers come to our table at the board, and the people who actually buy the food, take it home and eat it, come to our board. All of those stakeholder groups participate in decision making. Since we're obviously a, a socially aware community-based organization, we realized we needed the support of community partners like Parto Community Health Center, so we invited them as well to be a fourth stakeholder group. So all four of these stakeholder groups then participate in our democratic processes. Like many core practitioners, James had an early interest in social activism. I, worked, I went to school um, to the University of Waterloo for peer applied math. There are no jobs for young mathematicians really, so I got a lot of jobs writing software. And uh, I just got jaded with that. I was making ridiculous amounts of money, and that, that's nice, but nothing really seemed consistent with the sort of more earthly, more connected to day-to-day to, um, -day processes environment that I grew up in. So eventually I just sort of walked away from that. Instead ran a, a rooming house, sort of a drop-in center for youth uh, in Lindsay, a town by Peterborough. And that got me engaged with social activism, with understanding that I could actually be empowered as someone who contributed from my position of privilege back to my community using a lot of the communication skills and technical skills that I learned in the IT industry. But after a few years of doing that, uh, I started actually participating in the social justice movement directly, and through there realized that I should probably move to Toronto where I have more opportunities to do even more cool stuff. The first crucial step is tapping into the energy that exists in your community. Right? So you have to find like-minded people, you have to find an idea that makes sense. In, in an urban environment centered around food, obviously farmers markets and, and co-op grocery stores make sense. In, in a semi-urban environment that has had a lot of in, in decay of the industrial infrastructure, maybe some industrial cooperative venture makes sense. But something will make sense to you. Something will start to make sense to your friends. They would, they would be willing to get behind that idea. They'd be willing to actually do something to capitalize that idea. Start handing out posters. Look for local farmers markets or, or other venues that you can engage with community people and get your idea out there. That engine can slowly gain up speed. You can start to do a little bit of market analysis. You can research community bonds, see if you can raise community bonds and, and use them to capitalize that kind of a venture. Then, then you're going, right? You just set up regular monthly meetings and, and, and start doing the work.
The story of the Western Food Co-op highlights the connection between individual health, community life and politics. After all, a political decision of some urbanites to take democratic control of the food system will have transformed the conditions of life in that community. This interdependence of the political and the economic is known simply as political economy. I'm an activist. I got interested in co-ops uh, at a very young age in British Columbia. I grew up in BC where co-ops are fairly prominent and a fairly big part of society. And I got very interested in cooperatives as uh, an alternative both economically and politically. So, I, And particularly, uh, I've always been very interested in the democratic piece of the cooperative sector. The idea that uh, if political democracy is good, why not economic democracy? That seems like an obvious kind of thing to me. John Richmond is one of the founding members of the Western Food Co-op. We met him at Sororan's farmer's market where the Western had its first beginnings. John gave us a historic perspective on the cooperative movement and its politics. I think internationally it's really important to remember Robert Owen, uh, who a lot of people in the co-op sector are not familiar with, but Robert Owen was the guy in England who started the original cooperatives, uh, the industrial cooperatives, uh, making textiles. Um, he was an industrialist who um, owned factories and wanted to reform the system and discovered that none of his fellow capitalists were interested in reforming the system, uh, much to his shock, much to his surprise. And so he decided, well, the solution is to hand the factory over to the workers. And he was a pioneer in many respects, a really amazing person. And a little known fact about Robert Owen is that Engels uh, attended uh, many of Robert Owen's lectures and sermons, as they, were, as they were sometimes called, and was very, I think, moved in a way by Robert Owen's ideas. But at the end of the day, Marx and Engels decided that Owen's ideas were utopian, right? And in, uh, with Marx and Engels, being utopian was the kiss of death. And then with the advent of the Soviet Union and, and the communist bloc countries, not only the ones allied to the Soviet Union, but also in places like Yugoslavia, the idea that you were a utopian was, was somehow a bad thing, which is kind of sad because utopia, utopian is, is a dream. It's a dreaming thing and everyone needs to dream. Everyone needs to have hope. And Robert Owen was fantastic about giving people hope. And what happened, I think, in English-speaking Canada is that we, there wasn't the drive in English-speaking Canada in the 1920s or 1930s to eradicate capitalism in a revolutionary, uh, possibly violent kind of way, because it, would, it wasn't needed. We had a democracy. It wasn't a perfect democracy. It's far short of what we have now, but it was a democracy. We had the rule of law, and you could change things by changing the laws. So very quickly people realized we could change laws so that the laws were beneficial to cooperatives, to, to, to enable the creation of cooperatives, to give cooperatives legal status. And so I think what happened in, in not only in English-speaking Canada, but in other English-speaking countries, is that the capitalist system itself realized we can give these people their space and we can allow them to advocate for themselves, we can allow them to create their institutions. It doesn't really change the fundamentals of the capitalist system, so that's good for us, like if you're looking at it from the point of view of the people who ran the system. And in return, the cooperatives understood that if they didn't rock the boat, they would, their, their existence and their space would be protected within, within the system. And so, over time, I think what happened is that the cooperatives stopped advocating strongly and openly for a cooperative society. In this capitalist society, co-ops have had to compete to survive. Yet at the same time, they've been able to create extensive networks of solidarity and mutual support. By cooperating, individuals could realize their personal talents more fully and address their collective needs more effectively than if they had to compete with one another. Even more importantly, by giving individuals an equal voice inside their organizations, co-ops expanded social inclusion. Research in social epidemiology shows that social inclusion is the most important factor in human health, while social evaluative of threats and status competition undermine it. So the question is, in a capitalist world of intense competition, an increasingly stratified hierarchy. How far can co-ops succeed without advocating for a cooperative society? In part two of this presentation, we'll look more closely at co-ops as they exist in capitalism. 
For more information about the feature film, go to silenttransformation.ca. And lastly, an update. Since the posting of this project online, the West End Food Co-op has lost its store location to the needs of the merger between the Parkdale Community Health Center and a neighboring health organization. As it looks for a new space, the West End continues to provide a range of services in Parkdale.